Welcome back to the London Free Press Podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay Barnett. First of all, I just got to say thank you. I received a few messages last week asking if you guys had missed the podcast. No, there was no podcast last week. Um, Parents had enough on their plates. It was, I'm not going to call it March break because it's April, but it was spring break last week. So we decided to take the week off of the podcast, but we are back. So thank you though. And just a reminder that you never have to miss one of these podcasts. You can subscribe through Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and of course, over at lfpress.com. It's been a busy couple of weeks, no exceptions. I'm very excited to catch up once again with London Free Press health reporter, Jennifer Beeman. Jen, how are you doing today? I'm pretty good. How about you? I'm doing well, thank you. You have had, I feel like an online stalker a little bit. You have had a very busy couple of days with regards to the articles that you have been writing all things COVID, but it's because once again, so many things are rapidly changing. So last within the last week, since missing the last week's podcast, we've seen AstraZeneca now available to people 40 plus at pharmacies in London, Middlesex. That's huge. Um, I know some people who have had it. It's been a very smooth experience. So if you fall into that category, please go get it. Um, I'm still underneath that threshold, but I'm telling you, if I could get a fake ID that said I was over the age of 40, I would be doing it. Um, There's also been a lot of chat about this was the first week we were kind of losing some of our vaccine supply to the hotspots. We have seen what Premier Doug Ford has done. um, Toronto obviously suffering. I'm somebody who was like, oh, like watching the numbers last week just go up and up and up. It was kind of like a morale blow, but Dr. Chris Mackey had a really good spin for that. So what kind of stuff have you been hearing about us losing some of our vaccine supply? So we have a 25% happening to our Pfizer supply as of next week. Um, We could see this coming a mile away. Toronto is on fire right now. And there's workplaces there, you know, 40 year old people that are ending up in the ICU because they work shoulder to shoulder with people on the job take public transit to work, go home and infect their family of six, including, you know, their elderly parents that live with them. So, you know, last week, our numbers were really high locally. We had a bad week. We set a record 176 cases Uh, in the last few days. Anyway, there's been a bit more stabilization. Now we had 128 today, which is not great uh, after, you know, three days of double digit increases, but, you know, we're going to bounce around a little. But again, as long as we're not seeing that the surge upwards and, you know, it's easy to want what other people want, you know, where humans can be kind of jealous sometimes, but I don't, there, there's a humanitarian reason to be giving hotspots vaccine resources and what happens there affects us here. LHSC is, is taking in people from all over other hospitals in our region are as well. Like What's happening in Toronto affects us all. What's happening in Toronto is why we're in lockdown right now, largely, you know, and it's just um, so necessary that that gets dealt with. The sooner their house is in order, the better. I just want to be perfectly clear, though, with regards to the vaccines that we're losing. It's just the Pfizer or Moderna, right? It's not affecting the AstraZeneca allotment that we have in the region. Uh, that's that's correct, right? Yeah, the 25% reduction the health unit was talking about is just in our Pfizer thing. Now that is the majority of the vaccine that is, you know, in our in our mass vac centers. Uh, Moderna has only ever been a very small part and it's, you can't set your watch to it. It's had a lot of delays and kind of changing in supply. AstraZeneca is an interesting one. That's the health unit doesn't really deal in AstraZeneca. It's more pharmacies, the province directly to those. But um, I mean, nobody wants fewer vaccines. Everybody wants more vaccines, but you know, I think that at this rate, if we want to get us all out ahead, we have to start really targeting these the people that need it the most that are causing the spread. I I agree with you 100%. It's really interesting. Randy Richmond wrote a really great piece about a mom who has a son in his 20s, um, who is unwell, so to speak, like the flu, which is not COVID could be lethal to him. Um, And like, why is that not being addressed? Now, interestingly enough, As of right now, the time of recording, we are currently waiting for today or tomorrow an announcement from the Middlesex London Health Unit with regards to an expansion of eligibility for the vaccine. What can you tell me about that? So, you know, we're in the second wave right now. The province's rollout. They've just got the over 60 crowd. That's really the last age group general population thing that that we're going to see this phase. Uh, What we'll be moving into next will be these conditions, health conditions, not all health conditions, just some, and they're kind of tiered in like three bands of, you know, next one, one after that, one after that. So 
Um, that's what we'll be seeing. The health unit doesn't think that the reduction in the Pfizer will really do a whole lot to delay or anything, our, our sort of rollout here. So that'll be what we'll need to see next is um, how the health unit works through these chronic health conditions and then on to essential workers. But that those people who can't work from home, that category is the last part of phase two. Interesting. So it's, yeah, it's kind of wait and see with regards to there is no direct timeline, so to speak. And I know that's something Dr. Chris Mackey has talked about. We're in a pandemic and the word unprecedented, I think has been used a record amount of time since last year, but they're kind of just waiting on direction as well with regards to vaccine supply. And so I'm curious to see when we do hear this announcement, who is going to be included in it. But I do think it's a positive sign that we are kind of shifting away from the age groups now um, and getting more into the nitty gritty, so to speak. You wrote a really interesting piece too. And we were chatting before we started recording about how the next few days is going to be critical for this area with regards to potentially coming out on the other side of the third wave. Now, It's Wednesday. We're recording on Wednesday. There was 126 new cases recorded today. That's our first day this week, so to speak, in triple digits again. I saw that and I gasped. We were chatting and you were like, well, you know, it's not really a surge. So what is the health unit saying with regards to the next few days? What kind of numbers do they need to see to kind of officially declare us on the other side of the third wave? So we're, you know, we're kind of a large community, but our numbers do jump around quite a bit. And that's just what happens when you've got a population our size. So yesterday we were in the double digits, you know, two days before that as well. Um, The health unit wants to see a stabilization or a decline. So, you know, 76 to 128, not great. If it keeps going up day after day, kind of, you know, if that's the general direction, that's not something they want to see. Um, Although, you know, we're going to see little jumps day to day and little declines day to day. We can't call it over tomorrow if our cases are, you know, 50 or something, that's not the way this is going to work. So, you know, it's, you can't just take it with one single day's data. You've got to kind of look at it through the next five to seven days. And, you know, the health unit is saying we we will be reaching the two week point of our stay home order this week, which will be, you know, and we saw in the second wave, it dropped the numbers pretty quickly. Uh, Cargill is, closed down and has all the outbreak measures in place and all those people in quarantine. So there's going to be kind of a, a hopefully an end to that large outbreak. We've got students leaving, we've got classes being canceled. So there's, there's all kinds of things working here that'll probably, you know, hopefully get our cases low and continue on that decline. I was going to ask, and I don't know, I'm kind of putting you on the spot. You mentioned the students are in the process of moving out. Um, I had read an article that over 50% of students who migrate to the city for school have already moved out. And that's been happening over the last two weeks, because obviously schools have to pivot now with the stay at home order. Um, Do we know what the numbers kind of look like? Is Dr. Chris Mackey still talking about the 18 to 25, 22 year olds that we saw with the huge spike in cases? So there's all kinds of increases in all age groups. We can't say it's just the students, but I've been noticing, I track day to day as well, that, you know, that, that under 29 age group, um, zero to 19 and 20 to 29, those two really do seem to be continuing to have kind of the highest increases day over day. Um, They make up, you know, a a significant proportion of, of our daily case counts still. Um, N6A was an interesting one I wrote about last week. That's a, a large area that encompasses a lot of student neighborhoods. And it was, you know, first in the province a couple of weeks back for percentage of tests coming back positive for COVID-19. So um, we've certainly had this kind of community that's had, you know, some issues, certainly in bumps in the road. And that's not all students, but again, that's, that's been a thing. N6A is still very high. Um, the next week after they were number one, they were number two in the province. So um, we are still seeing that sort of thing. Um, but again, it's, it's not just them. Certainly it's across all age groups too. Absolutely. Are we hearing anything with regards to the N6A postal code? Cause there was a lot of chatter, like Elmer's postal code has been included in a hotspot. And I think it would be fair to say, like you said, we were number N6A was number one in the province a couple of weeks ago. Has there been any discussion about modifying some kind of vaccine rollout for that postal code specifically, or is it just, it was a lot of students, a lot of them who don't change their licenses when they move here, will see a drop when they leave the city. 
No, I haven't heard anything about targeting vaccinations. I know that there was a push to get it declared a provincial hotspot, which would kind of funnel resources to it. Again, it's percent positivity on tests. So that means, you know, is that like 30%? So three out of 10 tests from COVID were coming back positive there. Not a good thing. But when you look at rates and hospitalizations and other things that are kind of what the province is using to declare other regions hotspots, we just, we're just not there. Um, there's still certainly a lot of disease and community transmission in London. It's not a, it's a very critical time right now. We all need to be very careful, but I mean, when you compare it to places like Peel that are, are shipping out on it, you know, on land ambulances and helicopters, people out of their hospitals as fast as they get them. But like, I, there's no question that we're nowhere near that level of crisis right now. Absolutely. I think that's an important thing to remind people of. And when we talk about the daily numbers, yes, we're referencing 126 new cases as of Wednesday. But if you look at the overall active cases, I think it only jumped by six today versus yesterday, which really is not like what is six people out of the couple hundred thousand people residing in the city of London. Something else that you talked about a little bit ago that I want to touch on is our ICU taking on patients from outer regions. I know the health unit has been very busy, just like health units across the province. What are they saying with regards to the ICU? Is there any concern that if somebody were to fall severely ill here, there may not be a bed for them because we are taking on people from Toronto and Peel and other areas of the province? So the good news is, is we're still building capacity at LHSC. I was speaking to them. They they are building capacity kind of by, by cutting back on surgeries they can put off. So they're taking those surgery room people and putting them in the ICU and saying, you, you're, you're doing that now. That's your job now. Um, they're reducing further this week. So they'll be down at about 50% of their surgery volumes. They could probably reduce a little further to kind of free up some of those people. Um, there are other, there are other hospitals in our region that are taking GTA patients as well. Um, St. Joe's has been a really good partner for LHSC too. They're, they're taking away some of their patients that they can handle, um, just to help free up LHSC. So I, I'm not sure we're at a point where our, our hospital is at risk of running out of beds specifically, but I mean, this is something that Londoners really need to understand is even if our cases drop significantly, even if we're in like the 40 range next week it's going to take a good long while for our hospital to get, um, you know, really back on track. We're, we're at 86 on Tuesday of, of COVID-19 patients, and they were expecting between two and five new transfers a day from the GTA every day this week. So, I mean, case counts improving great, but, but our hospitals are, are really, really dealing with a lot right now. And, and that's why our stay home order is lasting as long as it is. Absolutely. Um, you wrote a really good line too about the LHSC has done a really good job about redeploying doctors and nurses to create um, staff additional intensive care beds, but they've also launched their own adult transfer team to support other services, including Orange. So it's not just about uh, like the COVID units, so to speak, but they're making their own moves internally to accommodate for this stuff, right? Absolutely. Like there it's, it's really all hands on deck and, it, and you know what, it's, it's not just LHSD anymore. That's a regional hospital, a very big resource, but there are smaller hospitals in our region that are also taking GTA patients. It is that bad in Toronto. It is, it is that critical right now. They're trying to avoid a triage situation where it becomes a, a, a matter of who gets the ventilator, which is just horrific and, and kind of a next level end times crisis. Um, but it's really all hands on deck to get this going. So um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the next couple of weeks. We know that hospitalizations don't rise at the same time cases do. So there's a bit of a lag there. Um, but, but really, it's very, very crucial that everyone does what they can to, to not be a risk, to not be a, a disease spreader, to just, you know, hunger down, stay home, um, get, this, get this curve flattened. Absolutely. And I think, again, we're going to see, I'm hoping, some positive downswing um, once we hit the two-week marker of this stay-at-home order. Thank you so much for your time. I know, for me, I I don't want to say I'm a doom scroller, but it's definitely a nasty habit I've gotten into during the pandemic. And I religiously, I keep the Middlesex London Health Unit tab open on my Safari, on my iPhone, and every day, noon, I check the new cases. So I just want to say thank you so much for keeping us up to date. I know how exhausting that can be. So thank you for that, Jen. And thank you for the time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, no problem. Thanks so much for having me.
I look forward to hopefully chatting next time and it'll be good things and hopefully measures will be decreased and we'll start seeing some fewer limitations and kind of a back to normal way of life. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for the London Free Press podcast. If you're enjoying these, you can find us on any major streaming site where you get your podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe. And that way you won't be wondering if you missed an episode, if we do take a week off again, um, because you'll get the push notification. So head over to lfpress.com too. There's so much going on. City Hall, Green Bin programs, how many animals we can have. Like I said, Randy Richmond, That story he wrote about the mom, really, really good. All kinds of stuff. So make sure you head over to lfpress.com. We will be back again next Thursday with a new episode. Until then, stay well.